Alhamdulillah, about a month ago, I had the honor of being in Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Imam of Masjid al-Aqsa, he points to kind of like a mimbar that you can see off in the distance. And he says, there is a school there that 20,000 women scholars have graduated from. And they would teach in Masjid al-Aqsa. And they would travel to Syria. And they would go to Syria. And they would teach in Syria. And Masjid al-Aqsa is this incredible, incredible area, subhanAllah, tabarakallah. Not a single space of it has not been walked upon by a prophet. Not a single space of it, whether a prophet or an angel, has not been occupied by that space. This is a land of blessing. This is a blessed space. And in that space, what we see is this history of women scholars, this history of women teachers. Like Umm Darda al sughra radiallahu anha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her, that she came and she would teach where the Dome of the Rock now is, inside or outside. And then when her lessons were done, the Khalif at the time would come, he was her mahram, he would hold her hand and they would walk to Masjid al-Qibli where he would lead Salah. Many times when people see Masjid al-Aqsa, there's this like, that's not actually Masjid al-Aqsa, that's the Dome of the Rock. And it's interesting because that's not correct. The Dome of the Rock is one masjid of five that is within the compound of Masjid al-Aqsa. So when you see that other one that everyone says, that's the real Masjid al-Aqsa, that is Masjid, it's called Masjid al-Qibli, but it's one masjid of many masajid within the massive compound of Masjid al-Aqsa. And within this compound, subhanAllah, when Umar radiallahu anhu came into Jerusalem, came to get the keys to Masjid al-Aqsa, to, to Quds, to Quds. The very first time that the Adhan was going to be called in Quds, the very first Muslim to pray in Masjid al-Aqsa after the Prophet wasallam himself had prayed there, when Umar radiallahu anhu takes the keys and he comes in, and then it's a much longer story, but just focusing on the aspect of going into the place of Aqsa, he didn't know where Aqsa actually was because at that time, what happened was the Christians who had ruled previously, remember Surah Al-Rum, Surah Rum, Surah Rum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are going, um, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to, uh, he, he prophesizes, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's telling them, he's telling them that the, Rum, the Romans have been defeated, but they're going to get it back. They're going to, def the, they're going to defeat the Persians. And this was like shocking at the time. But what happened is the Persians had destroyed this area of Masjid al-Aqsa. Then the Christians came and they were not respectful of the area of Masjid al-Aqsa. So it had been turned into a dump. Masjid al-Aqsa was a physical dump. It was a place in the space of time where crusaders would keep it as a pig pen. It was a place where you can still see the markings of the crusaders where they would latch their horses to the walls because they would keep it like a stable. So this area when Umar radiallahu anhu comes in, he doesn't exactly know where's the actual like place, spaces of worship. And so one of the companions who used to be Jewish, who had converted to Islam, showed him radiallahu anhu where. And then he asked Bilal radiallahu anhu to make the adhan. Now Bilal had been the mu'adhin of Medina, but he had left Medina after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. He used to make the adhan in Medina, and then the Prophet ﷺ passed, and he couldn't bear to make the adhan in the city where the beloved ﷺ was resting, where the beloved ﷺ asked him to make the adhan, and when he would come upon the name of the Prophet ﷺ in the adhan, the, the pain, of the entire city and hearing the adhan it was so different after the loss of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Bilal radiallahu anhu asked for permission to leave Medina. And he was going with a group of people, including Ubadah ibn Swamit, and he was part of the Fath of Al-Aqsa. And when he was part of the Fath of Al-Aqsa and Umar asked him to make the adhan, initially he said no. And then Umar radiallahu anhu encouraged him saying if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was here, he would want him to make the adhan. So Bilal radiallahu anhu made the adhan. And when he made the adhan, radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu just fell to his knees sobbing. It was the first time the companions had heard the adhan from Bilal radiallahu anhu. But can you imagine that now it's in Masjid al-Aqsa? Can you imagine that now it's where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led all of the prophets? Can you imagine that this is a space where the angels have been and the angels have come and Angel Jibreel alayhi salam gives the revelation to Maryam alayhi salam that she's going to become the mother of Isa to Zakaria alayhi salam that he has been he has answered in his dua that he's been making and making. SubhanAllah, this space is where 
Um Haram bint Milhan, the companion radiallahu anha, was with her husband Ubadah ibn Samit. Ubadah ibn Samit is buried right outside of the wall of Masjid al-Aqsa. So if you go to the compound, there are graves on one side, um, outside of the, of the compound, and you can go, his grave is literally at the wall with another companion Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhumah. When you go to see Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu anhu, he is buried right at the wall where Masjid al-Aqsa is. This was one of the first scholars and judges of this whole area in Philistine. This is just the opening the fetch of this area. And who was with him? Um Haram bint Milhan radiallahu anha. So when we talk about 20,000 women scholars who graduated, 20,000 women scholars who taught in Aqsa and went to Syria, think about where that tradition began. It began with the women companions themselves. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ took a nation who would bury their daughters alive and mentored them to learn from women as their teachers. So Umm Haram, she was actually a relative of the Prophet ﷺ, and it could have been through blood lineage or it could have been through rodaa. It might have been because um, of the way that they would have the nursing system where if, uh, if, if, if there's, there's lineage that's established when people nurse each other's children. And so the Prophet ﷺ would go and would sleep at her home. This is his, his aunt. And it wasn't just her. She also had a sister, Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha. And their stories are so powerful because of who their personalities were and because of the fact that they were so intentional despite the hardship that they faced, the resilience that they showed, and the intentionality of their worship as women is one that, subhanAllah, we see the Umm Haram was there when the Prophet ﷺ woke up smiling from a dream. He had this beautiful dream. And she asked him, What's, what are you, why, why are you smiling? And the Prophet ﷺ had fallen asleep because she was massaging his hair. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was looking for something in his hair. And can you imagine the Prophet ﷺ carrying the message of Islam, carrying the worry of the whole Ummah, worried about his own family members, worried about his own daughter, losing his own son, losing every single one of his children except for Fatima radiallahu anha, and then going to who is like his aunt and just relaxing, just like spending time with his khala, just having that moment of peace and security. And so he is with her. And when he is with her and she's going through his hair, combing through his hair, looking for things in the hair, he falls asleep with that kind of like hair massage, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he has this dream and he wakes up smiling. And when she asks about it, he tells the dream, which is a prophecy of what is going to happen, that these companions, that they're going to be riding on the ship, that they're like kings. And she asked to be a part of this group. And the Prophet sallallahu doesn't respond with, no, it's enough for you to stay home. The Prophet sallallahu doesn't respond with, don't you know the fact that you're, you have a prophet falling asleep, taking naps in your home is enough for paradise for you? The Prophet sallallahu response wasn't, well, you have responsibilities to your husband and your children. The Prophet sallallahu response was, you will be with them. And another narration making dua for her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have other narrations of mothers coming and asking about their reward. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that their reward is in taking care of their home, is in taking care of their children, is in taking care of their husband. Every single woman companion had a different lifestyle, life reality, personality, life objective. And what's so powerful in the seerah is that we see that their aims for Islam were appreciated by the Prophet ﷺ. Whether it was the Banu Ghifar tribe, the woman of the Banu Ghifar tribe coming and asking to help nurse the wounded, and, and, and the Prophet ﷺ at the Battle of Khaybar saying, with the blessing of Allah, giving them the blessings of coming, or in another circumstance where it would be better for a woman to pray in her home because of the dynamic she had with her husband. Every single person's reality was reflected in the society of the Prophet. ﷺ. And it's an obligation upon us as women, really, to mirror the nuances of that dynamic. So that we don't have young women who go into a masjid space, and many of us, alhamdulillah, are blessed with MCC here. And some, some of you asked the question in the other session. We do have a, a couple of amazing masjid, alhamdulillah. But what about all those masajid that don't have that example? And where we don't feel like we can have a space, and where our daughters grow up, or our sons grow up not seeing that as what should be normative access. What about for them? And the message 
when someone grows up in that way, not knowing that Islam is actually for every single one of us, no matter what we are going through, the resilience that we're showing, inshallah, that really can shift the way a person has their relationship with Islam in general. And I get messages like that every single week. And those of you who are from the generation of mothers and grandmothers in this room, I'm seeing you nodding your heads. And maybe you've seen that in your own lives. Maybe you've seen that in the lives of your children. Maybe you've seen that in the lives of, of your peers whose grandchildren are making a different decision. And it's a very difficult one to acknowledge when we see that there could be a different reality if we were to mirror the society of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um Haram radiallahu anha, she wanted to go on this expedition. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she taught us a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the best jihad for a woman is what? What is it? No. But nice, very nice try, may Allah bless you. Louder. Not a, no, but very nice try. Hajj, Hajj, it's Hajj. The answer is Hajj. Um, but I love that mo multiple people said taking care of the family. That is a jihad first. May Allah bless every single one of you in every single way. Reward you all and the men and all of our ummah. Ameen. And so Aisha radiallahu anha learns from the Prophet sallallahu this narration. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes away, Aisha radiallahu anha wants to make Hajj again because of this narration. Because of the strength of this narration and her seeing that it is the best type of worship for women. So she goes with the women, uh, the mothers of the believers, not all of them, but the majority of them, wanted to go for an extra hajj. Because Aisha radiallahu anha had already made hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the obligatory hajj. And what happened to her when she went? Yes, she got her period. And what did she do? She cried. She sobbed. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw her, he comforted her. He connected that moment of pain for her to a prophet, her great-grandfather, Adam alayhi salam. And what? He taught her the rights of how to make hajj in this circumstance. Her sharing that narration is a gift for all of us until the end of time. And subhanAllah, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, he was in a circumstance in his time period where he had to make a fatwa for what women should do when they are on their periods in Hajj and they can't finish Hajj before they leave. Before the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, there was a political, uh, there was political support for Hajj, which meant that the ruler or the rulers of the area, they would have Hajj caravans go out to meet the Hajjaj on their way back. So you're, you're going through the desert for days, months, almost a year, depending on the place that you're coming from. And there are bandits in the desert. You don't have water and food. So they had these caravans that would meet the hedge caravans. They would meet them on the way, and they would provide for them the, the provision that they needed and the protection. Because if you're constantly meeting caravans, there's less of a chance that there's going to be some sort of bandit coming through and trying to take your provision or even murder some of the individuals on the caravan. But during that time, the ruling class shifted. And they no longer put the, the, the policy of protection for the Hajjaj. That was suddenly gone. And so the Hajjaj who would come into Mecca and the woman who used to stay longer with their caravan to complete Hajj after their period, these caravans started to leave immediately. And they were scared because if they're going to stay to complete the Hajj just because they're on their period and it's only going to be one caravan of their relatives, or just a few people, that's not enough protection in the desert for months at a time sometimes. And so Ibn Taymiyyah looked at the reality of women and individuals losing their lives and their property because now they are stragglers on their own without the state's protection. And so he made a ruling that he said he hit the people before, the scholars before him didn't even have to think about this issue. It never came up for them. But now he made a ruling that if a woman is in Hajj and she's on her period or Umrah and she's on her period and she's not going to finish before she leaves and you can't always wait for Hajj groups to, to wait for you. And also, realistically, it's extremely expensive to delay for another week. Not everyone has that type of financial capacity. You can't always leave your children for another week or your job for another week or whatever the circumstance. And so now because of because of Aisha radiallahu anha going through that experience and Ibn Taymiyyah going through an experience in his lifetime, women today can go for Hajj or Umrah 
and make Hajj or Umrah if you are going to be there and your period is not going to finish while you are there and you cannot extend your stay, then you can just go ahead and make Hajj or Umrah in that state. Now, there's a difference of opinion on this issue. The Hanafis, for example, say that uh, um, a sacrifice is required. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't hold that position because he says it's out of her hands. But different scholars have different opinions. Don't just take this one statement and go for Hajj or Umrah. Talk to your local imam. Get some more information. This isn't intended to be a fiqh session on Hajj or Umrah. The only reason I'm telling you this is because Aisha radiallahu anha, despite the fact that she went through Hajj with the Prophet sallam, she saw Hajj as the best jihad because of the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. So after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, she wanted to go again. And then when she wanted to go again, she went to Umar anhu, who was the Khalifa at the time. And he did not allow it because they did not have a mahram. Now, when I was younger, I was invited to go on an Umrah group. I was in college. And uh, a local masjid here asked me if I could go with a youth group as kind of like a guide, like a hedge tour guide for the high school students. And at the time, I only followed the position that it was haram for me to travel without a mahram, and I didn't even know there was another position. So I asked a local scholar, what, why is it that there's a statement that Aisha radiallahu anha, that she went for hajj? Like, I mean, yeah, an extra hajj, like if her mahram wasn't there. He responded saying, well, Umar radiallahu anhu initially prohibited her from going. He prohibited her from going. So actually, she was in the wrong. That's what he told me. But Umar radiallahu anhu, if we look at the texts that describe his response, he allowed her because he was convinced by the strength of her proof. He's not allowing her as the Khalifa, as the one who is responsible for an entire nation, including the mothers of the believers, who are the highest caliber amongst the, amongst the highest companion, companions. He's, he's responsible for these decisions. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, convinced by her proof, he sent Uthman and Abdul Rahman radiallahu anhuma with her to go and make hajj with the mothers of the believers. And so she had the state protection. She had the state protection. She had these great companions go with them. And the reason that I wanted to mention any of that is because in that moment where that sheikh told me, well, no, she was wrong. Umar radiallahu anhu didn't agree initially. I have thought back to that moment so many times in my life. And I thought, why didn't he tell me that Umar radiallahu anhu himself accepted her proof? Why was it she was wrong and that was the end of the statement? We're talking about Aisha radiallahu anha. Why couldn't I have been taught it's a difference of opinion? Why was I taught there's only one right answer? And that perspective, when we're looking at the women companions, is really one that shifts our perspectives of ourselves as women in Islam. Because when Um Haram asks to go, she could have said, well, Aisha radiallahu anha taught us that later on, even if the statement about Hajj was made later on, she could have then said, well, actually, you know, there's a, there's a, a better form of worship, it's Hajj, and that's what I should do, which, of course, is 100% true. Of course, the best is such, such an important type of worship. But... She never amended her desire to go. And she was 75 years old. When Ubad and Ibn Samit, they had captured the Byzantine um, ships. And for a long time, Muawiyah, he wanted Umar radiallahu anhu to allow them to build a naval fleet. And these are people of the desert. They're not ready for a naval fleet. So Umar radiallahu anhu said no. But later on, Uthman radiallahu anhu said yes. And so this was the first group that was going on a naval fleet. And she wanted to go with them at 75 years old. Because years ago, she asked the Prophet ﷺ to be with that group of people. And the Prophet ﷺ told her that she will be with them. And this really speaks to the prophecies of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, because in addition to the fact that he had this dream and it did come true, because literally it could have just not come true, but it did. But she didn't have to go. It could have been her own personal decision. She might have passed away before that time. Literally anything could have happened to stop her from going. But she was with them. And it really speaks to the prophecies of the Prophet ﷺ when Fatima radiallahu anhu was told, excuse me, radiallahu anha was told that she was going to be the next one to pass away by the Prophet ﷺ amongst his family. And she was. When he told the mothers of the believers that the one with the longest hand is going to pass away first, they were measuring hands, but it actually meant the most generous one. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied who would go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next. And every single time it was true because he's a prophet of God. 
So when we see that Umm Haram joins this battle, we also see that her example is not in a vacuum because her sister, Umm Sulaim, Umm Sulaim, there are multiple narrations of the Prophet wasallam saying that he saw or he heard someone in paradise. And it was her. It was Umm Sulaim. In one narration, he mentions the footsteps of Bilal radiallahu anhu, the palace of Umar radiallahu anhu, and he mentions her. So Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha, the sister of Umm Haram, so also a relative of the Prophet sallallahu she is one of these women who has a very feisty personality. She has a feisty, assertive, aggressive personality. She's one of the women of Medina who are known to have these descriptions. And Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha, at a battle, she had a dagger. And her husband, Abu Talha, is like, one is to tell the Prophet, وسلم, like, look at my wife. <laughs> and the Prophet وسلم, is like, why do you have a dagger? And she's, she talks about how she's going to be there to defend. She's going to make sure that there's no deserters from the Muslim army. But she's there. That's the point. That she is there, and the Prophet وسلم, knows that she's there, and her husband knows that she's there, and she is present. Abu Talha, radiallahu anhu, he is the one who married her after her husband passed away. And who knows whose mother she is? Anas. Anas, the one who we have so many hadith from. The servant of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umm Sulaim was one of the first believers of Yathrib before it became Medina. When Mus'ab ibn Umayr anhu was there making da'wah to the people of Yathrib, she was one of the first people to accept Islam. And her son, there is a category of women in the companions, and that category is called the woman who accepted Islam before their husbands. The woman who accepted Islam before their families. These are the mothers that accepted Islam and guided their children to accept Islam. She guided Anas anhu from the time of childhood. Her husband came back after he was on a... Uh, like, a, like a, a trade trip and he noticed that something was different about them and he was not happy about her conversion and then he went on another trade trip and he died and she was considered to be exceedingly beautiful and she was known to be like a noble woman and so now a lot of men want to marry her and Abu Talha is like her level so he comes to her and wants to marry her and Abu Talha there is one thing that she asked for him as her mahar. Who knows what it is? Yes, his conversion to Islam. I have a lot of people tell me that their child who's in college or a young, young professional wants to get married to a man, but the man is open to converting. He's actually completely open to becoming Muslim. But they're worried that it's not really Islam because, you know, it's actually out of interest for the daughter. And so they don't want to say yes. And I just think, subhanAllah, you don't know who's, what is going to be the, 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 the moment where someone becomes Muslim, they find Islam, they accept it. Okay, maybe their role, they didn't find Islam other than through this woman, but they found Islam, they're co-workers, they're interested, and then they learn about Islam through her, they confer uh, out of, yeah, it's a general, I agree with, okay, it's in general, I agree, they, I could believe in that, but they're really converting because they're interested in getting married, even though they accept the shahada, and now they're a Muslim, and they, they may not pray five times a day, they may still be doing other things, but they generally accept it. But I've seen those people become the most committed to Islam in their families. I've seen that they are the ones who can help their spouse go from not praying at all to praying five times a day. Go from their children not caring about Islam at all to helping them love the masjid. You don't know what moment is going to be the reason someone really falls in love, not just with a person, but with Islam. So Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, he wasn't interested in Islam at first. He learned about Islam through Umm Sulaim. And she would ask him, like, are you really worshipping idols? Like, are you legitimately worshipping wood? That, like, if you got cold, you would break it and use it for fire? You're worshipping that? And Abu Talha... SubhanAllah is one of the one of the greatest companions. Radiallahu anhuma. So this woman who has this intense personality and her sister who wants to be with the group who goes in Cyprus, this 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 household is also the one 
that the Prophet وسلم, would visit out of love for them. Why? Because Um Haram, even though I mentioned her husband was um, Ubadah ibn Samit, this was the next marriage she had. Her husband and her son both were killed in Uhud. They were accepted Islam very early. When Uhud took place, 70 people were martyred in Uhud, 70 of the companions. And she found that both her husband and her son were martyred. And she took it with resilience. She radiated resilience. And then her brothers, her brothers were appointed by the Prophet ﷺ, a group of 70 of, the, of those who knew Islam, those who were hafal of what had been revealed so far, were asked to go and teach a tribe about Islam. This tribe requested that they send those who know about Islam to teach them. And her two brothers went. And her two brothers were massacred in this ambush against all of the companions who had went with them, with this group. And her brother Haram, he smiled as he was being killed. And he said, I won. I won. It is said that there are people, as they're passing away, one of my teachers told me that when someone passes away, sometimes they can see the place that they're going to be or an angel of goodness that comes and gives them glad tidings. And that moment, I'm going to tell you, subhanAllah, um, when, when I was studying in Egypt, there was a woman. I had gone to the masjid so that I can ask the imam if a group of us who were Americans studying in Cairo, if we could study with this imam. And I didn't physically see him. I mean, we were like speaking through a barrier. And I asked him, like, can we study Quran with you? Because he was known to be a scholar of Quran in that region. And he said, I don't teach women. And I said, we're a group of, you know, foreigners. This, this is like access that we normally don't have in America. This is way before like anything, YouTube streams and like online classes. And I asked, can we, can we study behind a wall? We will, even if we don't wear naqab, we will wear naqab. We will sit behind a wall. We don't need to see you. But can we just study with you? And he was very respectful and he said no. And I was very sad, honestly. I just thought, subhanAllah, this is such an opportunity to study with a scholar like this. And he's not comfortable teaching women. May Allah bless him. And I didn't know where else we were going to study with Quran with someone from this background. So I went upstairs into the musalla, and there were a small group of women there. And one of the women was like, can I ask you, what, what did you ask the sheikh for? Like, it, like, I went down to the sheikh's, you know, area where there's generally there's only men there asking questions. So she was like, what did you ask him? And I was like, you know, I really wanted to study. And uh, he, sa he said, no. And then she was like, you were truthful, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards your truthfulness. And she said, I am here because I'm going to be taking a tafsir class. And it's just for women. And she was holding books of tafsir. At that point, I barely knew any Arabic, and they were all in Arabic. <laughs> She's like, I will give you all of these books, and I will give you my phone number. And I was like, subhanAllah, may Allah bless her. And she gave me her phone number, and I met her again one more time. Um... And then many years later, when I was back, uh, it was actually not that many years later, it was a few years later, um, someone told me about a woman who was killed in Rabaa. She was in a hospital, and her back was facing the window, and a sniper shot her and killed her. And they said her name is Asma Saqr. And I was like, Asma Saqr? I know that name. But there's probably many Asma Saqr. So like. And then I saw her picture, and it was the same sister. But suddenly, on social media, I don't agree that this should have been done. I was shocked to see it. But it was her picture as she was covered in the, in the burial shroud. And her face was literally this. I have never seen someone smile that wide in my life, in life. I have never seen someone with a bigger smile alive. Then I saw with her picture in the burial shroud, just radiant. And again, I don't agree that that should have been spread on social media. I was surprised to see it. But that moment for me, I thought of what she said. You were truthful to Allah, so Allah was truthful to you. Look at how truthful she was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how truthful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with her. She didn't live a very long life.
رضي الله عنها رحمة الله عليها. But subhanallah, the fact that in such a short amount of time she made such an impact on my life and the lives of the people that she knew, رضي رحمة الله عليها, and that commitment to opening a door of knowledge for someone who felt like the door was closed for me in that moment, that was a moment that had I never known what happened to her, I still held that moment with such healing in my heart. When Haram is saying, I won, what kind of life did he lead? And he was Muslim for a very short amount of time. This is Uhud. He accepted Islam early. Jazakallah khairan. He accepted Islam early. He learned the Quran as much as it had been revealed. He was a half of the Quran for that amount of the Quran. And then, Fustu, I won. This is the family that Um Haram came from. So she's lost her husband, she's lost her oldest son, she has lost her two brothers, Um Sulaim radiallahu anha, the same. And their reaction is not to say, I don't have a space in the Muslim community, or Islam only brings hardship, or every single time I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, I'm tested even more, or why isn't my dua being answered that everyone around me that I love is being taken away? All of these are very real feelings. All of us have these thoughts and these experiences. That's very human. But what do they do with it? They say, how can we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way that's going to be the most effective and also in the way that fits their personalities? The way that fits their personalities. The great granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, her name was Sukaina. SubhanAllah, when I heard her story, actually Shaykh al-Muslima Perma was the one who told me her story first. And the way she told she was like, you would, she was like, you would love her. And the way she said it was like her personality was just like so like cool. She, the people wanted to be like her. She was an influencer of her time. She made a hairstyle as a preteen. A hairstyle that became so popular in Mecca. It was so popular in other areas that she didn't even live in. It was called the Sukainiya. Like people would do it was called the Sukainiya. And she would make her hair like this really cool way. And even the men tried to do it. And then Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was the Khalif at that time, he was like, stop, men are not allowed to do this. You will be punished. This is only a woman's hairstyle. Because men had long hair at that time too. And he wanted to differentiate their hairstyles. And so when a man came and proposed to Sukaina from her dad, her father, the, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you know what, what he said? He said, listen, Listen to her. So I told you about her, right? She has this like cool personality. She has a hairstyle that everyone wants to have. This is when she was really young. So you can imagine as she's growing older and, and people know her as this like amazing cool character with like everyone wants to be like her and Anna and, and all these guys want to marry her. And, and then what does he say? He says that her heart is too connected to Allah. She won't be able to handle being married. Like she won't be able to give you your rights as a, as a husband. Because her heart is too connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She does eventually get married. And her life is so devastating. Uh, one of the poems that she um, says is that um, to the people who murdered her, her father and then later mur murdered her husband, she said, you made me an orphan as a young person and you made me a widow as a woman. The, the pain that she lived was so real. And yet... When you read about her or you read the lines of poetry that she would write, her connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so much more real. That uh, intentionality of being who you are and when you face circumstances that shake you, what do you go back to? You go back to that connection, that light internally, that nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the, in the hearts of the believers. That there are going to be times that we will stumble and we will not be who we want to be. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I catch myself frequently thinking, I miss who I used to be. I wish I could be that person again. I wish I could be another person. I wish I could be better. There are times I have those thoughts where I just sit there and I'm like, when am I ever going to be who I want to become? And I know that the only reason I'm not becoming it is because I'm stopping myself. I am stopping myself. And yes, sometimes it's because of outside messages. And yes, it's just the reality of being busy with life and all of those things. But also, I, you know, it's funny because um, they say, like, you shouldn't really care about what people think about you. You should only care about what Allah thinks about you. 
and you should care about or sees you and not think so about how he sees you and what you think about yourself. And it's like, what if you're your biggest hater? What if you're your biggest critic? And the way you think about yourself is always one where you're never worthy enough. But that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Why did he create you to be a part of this ummah? Why did he give you the examples of Um Haram and Um Sulaim and Sukaina radiallahu anhun? Why do we have the scholars who were women throughout our history? You know, it's a really funny statement. Um, there's a woman um, in uh, another century. I don't remember this century off the top of my head, but she is in a masjid. And she um, is approached by a man. And the man says, you woman, you come in here and you put your heads on the floor and you raise your bottoms up. Because sajda. That's what he's referring to. And, and then she tells him, just put, your, put dust in your eyes and stop looking. That's what she says to him. But then do you know what he says? He says, I can't stop looking. And do you know what she responds with? She doesn't say, well, you don't deserve to be in the masjid, which honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't have responded the way she did, mashallah. She was like, I focus more when I'm here. When I'm at home, my children distract me. And that moment for me was very powerful because she expanded on why the masjid was something she placed she needed to be. She didn't have to do that. She did not need to give an explanation. She did not need to give a reasoning. She could have said, well, really, just stop looking. She could have just said that, and that was enough. But her giving us insight into that, I don't know what happened to this man. Maybe that conversation helped him recognize why sometimes for women with children, being in the masjid is so much more important than maybe someone in a different circumstance. But the point is that she said, I need this space. I need this space. And I need this space to be a place where I connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what impact is that going to have on her children? And what impact is that going to have on the children who see their mothers and their grandmothers going to the masjid and connected to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is the legacy that we are given. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I'll be the Himanish Allah Rajim Sumar Rahim. That those who are foremost, that they are the closest, that they are in paradise. That verse, when we talk about it, we talk about a very select few people who are part of that verse. So, I mean, we cannot compare to Um Haram and Um Sulaim, radiallahu anhumah or any of the companions, or any of those who came after them. But we can follow what a companion asked the Prophet them. We may not have prepared what they prepared, but we love them. We didn't, we didn't prepare what they prepared. We never can prepare what they've prepared. But we love them. And the Prophet them taught us that you are with the one that you love. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of the sabiqoon al-awwaloon, make us of the muqarrabun, make us of those who are in jannat al naim even if we know we don't deserve it. And then, even if we know we don't deserve it and we are harder on ourselves than anyone else's, and on top of that, we may feel like we're never going to be good enough, we ask Allah, Ya Allah, not because of my goodness, but because of your mercy. And not because of my actions, but because of my love for the people of action. Count me of those people. We live in a country where we do not hear the adhan five times a day. And we do not hear the aqama on top of that. But we still choose to pray. Or we're struggling to pray. In public places, in random places, just to make salah on time. Do you not think that the angels who are roaming the earth, who are sent to protect and make dua for you, are not acknowledging that, witnessing that, and praying for you? We're here for a reason, in this land for a reason, in this time for a reason. Every single one of us has a role to play. What that role is, we need to go back to what the woman companions did. Look at what our skills are, our interests are, our passions are, and stop denying them, and instead say, how can I use this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use this for his sake. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu wa na'idha ila'an, nashadu wa na'idha ila'an, nashadu wa na'idha ila'an, nashadu wa na'idha ila'an, nash